Okay, so now we're going to talk about therapeutic phlebotomy for hemochromatosis and polycythemia vera. And of course, we need to throw in the occasional dog or, in this case, cat photo. So what are we going to talk about? Therapeutic phlebotomy, we're going to talk about what is it and what are some common indications and some nuances of those common indications. We're going to focus on hemochromatosis and PV but you could also use it for porphyria cutanea tarda and of course transfusion associated iron overload. So pop quiz, in a classic patient with this illness, we have a patient with diabetes and a large liver who complains that my skin is slowly getting darker and the skin is kind of a deep bronze and this was cute in this um, case report article. They mentioned that the intern's leg on the far left served as an internal control for severe paleness compared to the bronze. So what is this? This is a classic example of so-called bronze diabetes or hereditary hemochromatosis. And this is characterized by an elevated serum iron, a very high ferritin, and high transferrin saturation, which we'll talk about in more detail. Hereditary hemochromatosis is the most common iron overload disease. It's about 0.2% to half percent prevalent in Caucasians. And the main problem you have is you're absorbing too much iron, right? You're absorbing iron at about three times the normal rate. It's generally a slow process with an insidious adult onset. What happens, you basically absorb and then deposit this excess storage iron in many organs, including your liver, heart, pancreas, and skin. There's a wide spectrum of clinical manifestations, a wide spectrum of laboratory phenotypes, including uh, a mainly biochemical phenotype for most patients, and thankfully, a small minority of patients end up having actual clinical manifestations, as we'll see. So what are the signs and symptoms? Usually it's asymptomatic, meaning there's a lab abnormality, but the patient doesn't complain of anything or doesn't have any signs or symptoms. Non-specific symptoms such as fatigue, arthropathy, arrhythmias, and impotence can occur. And we're going to take a brief detour, right, through iron studies testing. This is not a chemistry talk, but it's worth reminding ourselves just about the basics of iron studies, just so they don't seem um, really mystical to you, okay? So when you say iron studies, what do we usually talk about? There's iron or serum iron, right? Transferrin saturation, TIBC, total iron binding capacity, and ferritin. That's the usual menu of tests. So what are these? Iron or serum iron is the iron that is bound to transferrin, right? It's like a little storage vehicle transferrin that moves iron from place to place. If it were up to me, I wouldn't call it serum iron because it's not like it's free floating, right? So I would just call it transferrin associated iron. No one calls it that but me, but that's what I, when I see serum iron, I, I translate it in my mind to transferrin associated iron, so it makes more sense. Then you have, have, of course, your total iron binding capacity, or TIBC. That is the amount of iron that would be needed to saturate all of your transferrin. So it's asking the question, okay, you have all these transferrin little delivery trucks. What is their capacity for iron? That's basically it. Your transferrin saturation is a percentage. It just takes the top number, your transferrin associated iron, and divides it by your total iron binding capacity. It's like percent occupancy in some ways. And you can, of course, measure transferrin directly, but uh, as far as I understand, I'm no chemist, but I believe that doing it this way by just calculating it is cheaper than measuring it directly. And so where are, are these players in the body? So we have the, on top the duodenal lumen, and then we have the blood on the other side of the enterocyte. We have storage iron, which is mainly ferritin. Okay, so we have storage iron as ferritin. We have this ferroportin kind of doorway. I think of it as like a drain, a drain at the bottom of the sink or at the bottom of a tub. And this ferroportin drain allows iron to go through. And so this iron can be transported by this little delivery truck, transferrin, which transferrin is empty right now, 
but then once it gathers this iron, now it becomes transparent associated iron, which again, no one calls it that for some reason, but is now serum iron. So serum iron is here. Transferrin is the delivery truck and ferritin is storage iron. And then your TIBC is the total capacity that would be needed. And that just simply, or when you have your transferrin um, binding capacity, that's simply your serum iron divided by your total iron binding capacity. Simple as that. Bound transferrin, meaning serum iron, divided by your total amount of transferrin, your TIBC, all the delivery trucks. So some, you don't have to memorize these, but just to give you an indication of what are the normal ranges. So the normal ranges of iron are in the micrograms per deciliter and you know, less than a hundred to a few hundred. Transparent saturation is say 20 to 50%. Your TIBC is maybe double or so your serum iron, somewhere in the few hundreds micrograms per deciliter. And then I saved the best for last, ferritin, which is mainly what we are concerned about. So ferritin is the best measurement of your interstellar iron stores. Uh, there's no known function. Again, I'm no chemist. The last I checked, there's no known function of ferritin in your serum. And it enters into the serum by secretions from the reticular endothelial system, kind of as a, as a steady state concentration. And the way I think about this is ferritin is the best total iron indicator, assuming your CRP is normal. Uh, said more eloquently, I'm sure you've heard this in med school days, that ferritin is faithful unless febrile. So you spit on yourself, we say F so many times. So what they mean by ferritin is faithful unless febrile is that you can trust ferritin as an accurate measure of iron stores unless the patient has an inflammatory state, right? Because then Ferritin can be elevated as an acute phase reactive, but you already knew that. What is some normal ferritin ranges? Well, now we're dealing with tiny. So remember before we were dealing with micrograms for deciliter, now we're dealing with nanograms per ml. And it's in the neighborhood of, you know, say 30s to a couple hundred for males. And let's say, you know, 12 to 100 or 200 or so for females nanograms per ml. So vanishingly small quantities, but it, it serves our purpose of finding out what's a good measurement of total body iron store. So now, this seems like a detour, but we're going to get there. So again, we have your um, duodenal lumen, we have our enterocyte, we have storage iron as ferritin, we have this, the transporter that brings iron into the enterocyte, some of it is stored, some of it goes through this ferroportin drain, remember it's like a drain at the bottom of the, of the tub, and then that is then transported via transparent. We got that. But what am I adding? I'm adding hepcidin. Oh no, you knew hepcidin was gonna come in. So the way, this is the way I think about it. If it doesn't help you, that's okay, it's not for you. But for some people this might help. I think of hepcidin, the hormone, as the stopper on the ferroportin drain, okay? So I said ferroportin is like a drain, so iron can leave the enterocyte and go to the blood, but if you have hepcidin made by the liver, when you have enough iron, then you say, hey, stop it, I don't need any more iron, put that drain there and clog it up so that iron does not continue to be transported. And here you have some absorbed iron bound to to transferrin, and that will be lost from the body when the enterocyte dies. That's what's going on there. So hepcidin can kind of clog up the ferroportin, and in some cases, even the ferroportin can be degraded, so there's no drain anymore. So your transferrin saturation, while we're mainly concerned about ferritin as the measurement of storage iron, the transferrin saturation can come in handy, actually because it is the earliest lab change in hereditary hemochromatosis. So that's probably worth knowing. And abnormal is usually greater than about 45, 50%. You gotta do it fasting in the morning. It has a pretty decent sensitivity for hemochromatosis, but a very low specificity, right? It's not the only thing that can cause 
high iron, high transferrin saturation. Exactly. And if you have pets, don't do weird things to them um, to take funny photos of them. Like if it happens naturally, good, but certainly don't put your pet at risk. And I feel a little bit bad about including this because I, I suspect the human being put like a phone on the cat's face and it just seems, I don't know, it seems rude. The cat's just trying to, to kind of nap, trying to sleep, and I suspect the cat's trying to take this off. So I have mixed feelings about this image. Sorry, I have to deal with it. So a few words on the genetics of hereditary hemochromatosis. I didn't know this until I researched this for this talk, but I always see the HFE gene that is responsible for hereditary hemochromatosis. And I was like, what does HFE stand for? What does it stand for? Just high iron, high FE. I thought that was cute. Um, I would not have believed that had I not read it. It's on chromosome six and it's also HLA linked. And it's worth knowing, this is how you'll pay attention, that about 90% of people with hereditary hemochromatosis are homozygous for this uh, mutation, this C282Y, and a very distant second are C282Y heterozygous with H63D. This seems weird, but it's worth knowing, trust me. And the HFE gene product might be involved in the interaction of transferrin with the transferrin receptor. It's not, at least last that I saw, it's not clearly understood how the HFE gene product leads to disease, um, how exactly it does it. We, we could describe it clinically, but we don't really know the exact mechanism. And I should also say a, an even more distant third genotype is homozygous H63. H63D. That's so. First, distant second, and then distant third. So, just a reminder if you haven't heard of this term called penetrance in um, you know, molecular biology and genetics, all it means is that it's the frequency that a trait is manifested in a phenotype who are carrying the gene. So, you could have, you know, 100 people that have a certain gene, well, then how many of them? have a certain phenotype. It's not necessarily 100%. Sometimes it's high, sometimes it's low, sometimes it's in the middle. And a penetrance only applies to a given trait or clinical outcome. It doesn't really make any sense to say the penetrance of a gene, period. What makes sense is the penetrance of a gene that causes a certain phenotype or a certain clinical outcome, okay? This will make more sense in a minute when we talk about specific phenotypes and outcomes. So, if you have the most common genotype, the C282Y, what is the penetrance of that genotype? Well, it depends on what we're talking about. If we're talking about the phenotype of actually having clinical symptoms, it's about 1%. It's only about 1%. So if you had 100 people with this genotype, only about one of them would have clinical symptoms. Whereas 50 to 80% of these people would have a lab abnormality. A lab abnormality. And remember the first lab abnormality to change would be, yes, transferrin saturation. And the penetrance is much lower for the heterozygotes and even lower still for the homozygote H63D. So penetrance, genotype to phenotype. And a nice figure to show this is that if you have the HFE, the mutant HFE gene, most patients have an elevated transferrin saturation. We already talked about that. A smaller percentage of patients will end up having high ferritin. And then a, an even lower number still will have a significantly high serum ferritin of, I mean, I shouldn't say significant, like crazy high serum ferritin and some end organ damage in clinical signs and symptoms, okay? And that gets down to the single digit percents. Okay, then how does hereditary hemochromatosis happen phenotypically? Don't freak out about the busy image. Certain things are known, certain things are not well understood. One thing that is known, if you compare normal to hemochromatosis, one thing to think about is as you transport iron in sufficient quantities to the liver, and the liver says, okay, I'm gonna make a bunch of hepcidin as your signal that I have enough, stop it, negative feedback, right? 
And so the hepcidin signal is like a, again, like a drain stopper on the ferroportin drain. And so the iron stops being um, transported and ditto for macrophages. So enterocytes and macrophages, a significant hepcidin signal is sufficient to stop this or to decrease it dramatically. Versus in hereditary hemochromatosis, there's uncontrolled release of iron from macrophages and duodenal enterocytes. And it seems like in many cases, the hepcidin signal is decreased. So the hepcidin signal is decreased compared to normal. But more clinically, more high yield, what should you do if you have a patient with unexplained fatigue, arthralgias, hepatomegaly, high liver enzymes, you can look for biochemical markers of iron overload. The first one that would happen would be transferrin saturation. The second one in time would be serum ferritin. If your transferrin saturation is high, then of course rule out other causes and you can of course get genetic testing for the HFE gene to look for these two most common, commonly involved genes. This phenotype, excuse me, this genotype being the most common, this one being the second most common. And then that is a relatively definitive diagnosis for hereditary hemochromatosis. And if you have a positive mutation that we just mentioned, some visceral and metabolic consequences you should go look for, including you should do a liver biopsy for the dry weight of liver iron and also for baseline cirrhosis. And of course, you should do iron studies on all your first degree relatives. And then treatment for hereditary hemochromatosis, why should we do therapeutic phlebotomy? Well, if the patient is symptomatic, it will provide relief. We're trying to get rid of iron in large quantities, right? So if the patient's ferritin is greater than 1,000, we want to decrease the ferritin because we want to reduce the risk of cirrhosis and, of course, the risk of hepatocellular carcinoma. And the reason for that is there's about a, a few percent chance risk of HCC in about 10 years time. And of course, organ damage can only be prevented. It can't be reversed. So it's not like the therapeutic for body will get rid of previous damage, but it will prevent further damage. And so what are the treatment goals? Initially, we want to do a phlebotomy of one to two units. So one unit is 500 grams or uh, two units is a thousand grams of blood approximately weekly until you have your ferritin under 50 and your transferrin saturation under 30. That's an optimal initial phase goal. Then once you've achieved that, then you do a maintenance phase. This usually lasts a few months, up to six months on average. And your goal here is to keep the ferritin below 100 and keep your transferrin saturation below 50. The ferritin is very often the main analyte that we use to guide therapy. So the ferritin is usually what is used to guide therapeutic phlebotomy therapy. Usually when I repeat something, it's important. Hint, hint. And sometimes this shows up in, you know, um, pimp questions. One unit contains, one unit of blood contains about 250 milligrams of iron. Exactly. Usually by the time we talk about all that, people have no energy left and feel like they've died a death. But all we have left to talk about is what every resident seems to ask, which is, well, okay, can a patient with hereditary hemochromatosis donate red cells? Why should they pay money for therapeutic phlebotomy when they could just go over and donate the blood, fill up the same lousy bag of blood, and have the additional benefit in in addition to not having to pay for it, have the additional benefit of a patient can receive the donor blood. Everybody wins, right? Well, yes, can I just donate for free instead of paying for therapeutic phlebotomy? Well, the FDA, our overlords, say the following. No, if you charge for the procedure. If you charge for the procedure, which is a big incentive to do it the therapeutic phlebotomy way, right? Or yes, if you, the blood center, don't charge and you apply for a variance. If you jump through a bunch of hoops and you get a variance that allows you to do this. So if you're a blood center and you're not in the therapeutic phlebotomy business anyway, then you want more donors. And if you have a lot of donors that make it worthwhile, 
to get this variance, you can do it. But it's usually a big enough hurdle that people don't do it. And of course, if you're not in directly in the donor business and you're in the therapeutic phlebotomy business, then of course you could educate the patient about this, but you tend to want to have them do therapeutic phlebotomy, assuming they can donate, or assuming they're eligible to donate anyway. So some quiz questions, I'll let you do these uh, on your own to make sure that you've learned something. And then finally, we're gonna talk about polycythemia vera, so which is, you know, a clonal process, get it, cloning, yeah. it's the best I could do. So PV is one of the myeloproliferative neoplasms. The classic MPNs include CML, PV, ET, and primary myelofibrosis, PMF. And there's lots to say, but if you're new to this topic, a myeloproliferative neoplasm, a neoplasm is basically increased hematopoiesis in the relevant line. There's more nuance to that, but for example, CML is granulocytic proliferation beyond normal, PV, red cell proliferation beyond normal, ET, platelet proliferation beyond normal, and so on. Whereas myelodysplastic syndrome is an ineffective hematopoiesis. So you may have cytopenias just because whatever's happening in the bone marrow, normal cells can't get out in sufficient quantity. Again, lots to say about that, just in case you're a beginner, I wanted to define the terms. So this was back in 2008. I'm sure it's been revised since then, but it's probably worth knowing for your own sake, what are the criteria for all the different um, myeloproliferative neoplasms um, you need to have basically a high and unexplained hemoglobin and a JAK2 mutation, and then you can have minor criteria, which include myeloproliferation, a low EPO level, and this erythrocyte colony growth, which no one does. So what are some symptoms? Well, you may have no symptoms. You, this might be discovered incidentally when you do a CBC, like, wow, why is your hemoglobin so high? What's happening there? If you have symptoms, a common one is itching, especially after hot water, like you take a hot shower, oh, I'm itching like anything. It can include headache, uh, fatigue, reddish skin, you know, uh, ruber plethora, that kind of thing, and even as bad as arthritis. So why are we trying to treat these patients? Well, our main goal is to reduce viscosity and thrombosis risk, right? As opposed to hemochromatosis, we're trying to decrease iron overload and little slow long-term end organ damage, including liver damage and HCC. Here, we're trying to decrease viscosity and thrombosis risk. So we're not looking at the ferritin, we're looking at the hematocrit. We want the hematocrit be less than 42 as a common goal. Again, there's nuance to this. This is an intro talk, but we generally want the hematocrit to be below 42, and we'll usually risk stratify patients for thrombosis risk. So if the patient is older, then we will, not we, but the hematologist usually will add hydroxyurea and treat to a higher extent, in addition to just phlebotomy and aspirin, and if the patient has had thrombosis in the past, they'll also treat them to a higher magnitude. And it's also worth knowing what is the frequency of a JAK2 mutation for PV. It's nearly everybody. It's somewhere in the neighborhood of 95%, whereas it's roughly 50% for ET and PMF, some other MPNs. So about 95% of PV patients have the JAK2 mutation and I'll let you do the quiz questions on your own to verify you've learned something. And finally, I must say that out of lack of interest, today has been canceled.